This video is going to be about electric force and electric field. You might remember that from last time that we were looking at this topic, uh, we have this relationship called Coulomb's Law, which says if I have one charge, Q1, and another charge, Q2, suppose those are the same sign of charge, they're both positive, what's going to happen to them? They'll be repelled from each other. And we have a way of knowing how strongly they'll be repelled from each other based on how far apart they are. We call that R because often, since these things are spherically symmetric, it makes sense to use polar coordinates. So we're calling that distance a radius measured from the first charge. So what Coulomb's law says is that that uh, force is proportional to some constant, Ke, the electric constant, times the strength of charge one times the strength of charge two divided by the distance between them squared. And that constant Ke it's a pretty big number. It's 9 billion. It's 9 times 10 to the 9 what? The units are newtons, since I want to end up with a force, and I'm multiplying by Coulomb squared, so I'll have to divide by that, and I'm dividing by meters squared, so I have to multiply by that, so ne newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. How big is, big is a Coulomb? You might or might not remember that a Coulomb is approximately 10 to the 19 electrons. But an electron, the electronic unit is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So the coulomb is a pretty big unit compared to the kinds of charge we typically see around molecules, around atoms, and even in the lab we usually only see microcoulombs of charge or nanocoulombs. So here we've got our two charges, they have this distance apart, and this is the force between them. But this other idea, electric field, is closely related but really useful. The electric field is a function that fills space. So if I wanted to know, what would the electric force be right here? Well, it would be pretty big because I'm close to Q1. What if I were over here? It's still pointing away from Q1, but it's smaller. And if I were over here, it would be even smaller, but still pointing away from Q1. Over here, it's even smaller, but pointing away from Q1. So I see the strength of that force depends on my distance, but it always points away from Q1. So the relationship is we're saying the force as a function of R, force as a vector, so is my position, is going to be Q times some other vector field, some other vector function that fills space. And we call that E for electric field. So what must E be? Well, I already see if I take out one of these Qs, if I take out Q2, then I know what the force would be due to Q1 if I put a Q2 there. So the electric field is just everything that's left. So this is Q times whatever the electric field is, so that must be Ke times Q1 over R squared. And this thing we call the electric field. This is useful because it lets us know what the charge, what the force would be due to the first charge, even if the second charge weren't there. But if there were a charge there, what would the force be? It's important to know there's only a force if there's a second charge. But this function lets us know what the force would be at every point in space if there were a charge there. Because of that, the units of electric field are the force per charge, so newtons per coulomb. Since this is a vector function, we also know that it has to have a direction, and the direction is always away from the charge that's causing the field. So we call that the r hat direction. This r hat means a vector that's a unit long, one unit, so it doesn't change the size of this quantity, but it tells us it's pointing in the outward direction, whatever direction that might be. Speaking of this r hat direction, you might wonder what will change if this source of the electric field is going to be a positive charge or a negative charge. Well, I see if this quantity is positive, because I have a positive Q1 here, the r hat direction is the direction away from this Q. But if the charge causing the field is negative, we're going to have a field pointing in towards the Q. So if we take a look at those two examples, if I had just a positive charge, then I would have field pointing away from that charge. And if I had just a negative charge, I would have field pointing towards that charge. And this electric field shows the direction the force would be on a positive, what we call a test charge, a charge that has 
very little, very little influence on the system itself, but would move in a way that shows us the direction the electric field is going to go. So if I consider a positive charge here, it's going to be repelled from the positive charge and attracted toward the negative charge. Now we've said these are what the fields might look like if we had just the two charges, but in actuality we have both of those charges in the same space, and if we vector sum those, we're going to get something that looks more like this kind of pattern, where we're directing along these curves the shape of the electric field. And this is the kind of shape you would see if uh, space were filled with little hairs that oriented along the direction that the field is going. Speaking of little hairs, we can actually see this if we get this little device, which is a stick with little bits of fringe on it, and if I grab a piece of PVC and some rabbit fur, I can rub this and you hear the crackling, so we're charging this up. When we bring the PVC near this metal, we can transfer some charge, and that charge, all being negative, doesn't like to be together. So these threads are all spreading out, and they're showing us the direction of the electric field around this object. Uh, now, what happens if I bring the negative rod near those already coated in negative charge strands? Well, they're being pushed away, so we can see the electric field is changing due to the presence of another charge.